So when we left off last week, we or la, uh, two months ago, we talked about the our, the thana, the praise of Allah, in which we start. We discussed on the salah and how there's many different kind of thana you could recite. You know, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. This is right after you say Allahu Akbar in your salah. So you could say that Allahumma ba'id baini wa baina khatayya and etc. So after we, we covered one of these, and then we're now we're gonna move on, inshallah, to a'udhu billah. So the word a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Mainly, this is going to be intended to be informative, inshallah, bi ta'ala. So the thing is that the reason we say a'udhu billah is because Allah told us in Surah An-Nahl, seek refuge with me before you recite the Quran. So when we when we pray salah, we're about to recite Quran, are we not? So after that, we say a'udhu right after the thana, before we recite Quran, we say a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. There's a few different ways. A'udhu billahi sami'a alihi min ash-shaytanir rajim. But the bottom line is that we seek refuge with Allah. But the thing is now, we're so embedded in the saying that the translation of this is I seek refuge with Allah. It's not asta'idu, it's a'udhu. The, the difference is subtle, but it makes a point, is that we're not saying I seek refuge with Allah. A'udhu billah doesn't mean I seek refuge with Allah, it means I take refuge with Allah. The difference is that if a person comes in starving and he asks for food, is he going to say maybe, you know, could you know guys help me out a little, I'm kind of hungry and he's starving? Could you guys kind of give me some food? It's not showing desperation. So when he says, guys, I'm starving, I need some food. It shows desperation. So when we say, a'udhu billah, we're showing our desperation. That we desperately take refuge with Allah. And now we say, bina shaytan rajim From shaytan or rajim So the meaning of shaytan, shaytan, is something to be far away. And we know this is one of his names, basically. So it's basically a title as well. So his, we know, we call him by Iblis, he's a jinn. So... The main name he's given now is Shaytan. He's far, far removed from Allah's mercy, obviously. And also that is a decision that he made himself to be far removed from Allah's mercy. Because everyone in this life has an opportunity to, to pursue the, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's upon them if they want to take that opportunity or not. So then we call Shaytan al-Rajim. The sifa is al-Rajim. Rajim, Rajam, in one part we say, we say when like when you do target practice or anything like that, you know, you're trying to do something for a purpose, you're practicing for a sake. So that what we call that is in Arabic is Ramyu. And when we just throw some trash away, it's it's nothing, we just throw it away, that's Rajam. And also another meaning of Rajam is to stone. So Shaytan is basically trash that we want to discard. And at the same time, what we're trying to say to Allah is that we're seeking refuge with Allah from Him. And we're also saying that He kind of deserves to be stoned too because of His bad behavior. So proceeding, we, we kind of we try, we're going to try to internalize this kind of, the, these, these definitions now. Where when you say, A'udhu Billahi Min Ash-Shaytan Rajim in your next Salah, it's not just going to be A'udhu Billahi Min Ash-Shaytan Rajim. It's not just said for the sake of it. It's because Allah told us to say it for a purpose. And we should understand what it means and try to internalize it and say it with a meaningful heart, like we really want to. So that's basically the premises of the premise of A'udhu Billahi Min Ash-Shaytan Rajim. And then we're going to slightly touch on Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Basically, we say that with the name of Allah, or with the, we seek the help of the name of Allah, and we call him Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. So basically, it's like an intro, a beginning to what we're about to do. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. In the name of Allah, basically, we translate it as. So this is something that we should not say not only during salah, but in, in any course of action we do take in our lives. Anything we're going to do that we want the barakah of Allah, we should say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Because the, uh, we're told in a narration that anything done, any righteous deed done without saying Bismillah, without invoking the blessings of Allah, it's void of barakah. It's, there's no barakah in it. There's no blessing in it. So we're taught that we're supposed to be saying Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim before we do anything. You go, you go eat, you say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. You go brush your teeth, you say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. For example, you could brush your teeth right before salah, or you could use miswak, you say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, because you're trying to clean your mouth out and you're going to go talk to Allah in salah. So these are just general examples, little examples that we should try to internalize ourselves. And I don't want to touch it on Ar Rahmanir Rahim yet. We'll leave that for when we touch upon Surah Fatiha. So talking about Surah Fatiha, that leads us to Surah Al Fatiha. And Surah Al-Fatiha, basically, it means Fatihatun, it means the opener. And it, now when we say the opener, it's obviously the opener to Allah's book. So also Fatiha is also, it's, it, it's an introduction to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to who He is. So Allah begins. So now we have a, there's a, there's a kind of difference of opinion about the beginning of the Qur'an. Obviously it's Fatiha. But what is the beginning of Fatiha? Is it Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Or is it Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen? 
So obviously there's some, uh, many of you know, there's differences of opinions about, upon which one is, you know, the beginning, the true beginning. So personally, the opinion I follow based on some of the research that I've done is that Alhamdu is the beginning. And we could mention, uh, I could mention a little bit of the, the reasoning why I believe that if I get to the hadith or the hadith that I'm thinking of, uh, but that will be a little later, inshallah. If not this week, uh, today, then inshallah next month. So uh, now we proceed to Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, which we believe to be, or at least I believe to be, the beginning of Surah Al-Fatiha. So when we start off the first word, now this is something to think about. Like when you see something monumental, a, break, a great big occasion, some big event is about to happen. You want to monument it by the beginning of what happens. So when we think about it, Alhamd is the beginning of the Qur'an, if we take it like that. So that in and itself, and Allah says, Alhamdulillah. He said, He mentions His name next. So one thing we should try to understand about Hamd. Hamd is basically a word in Arabic that it basically means to praise. You know, praise in itself, the concept, the masdar of praise. But praise in a sense that, you know, complimentation and praise and it's also the word hamd is genuine praise. For example, someone might go see a, like anything just for the sake of being there. You know, for example, you have baby showers or whatnot. You have all these different things. Someone's kid came back and, you know, from a long trip and you go visit them. Someone, some, you know, something like this. So you go there, you just visit and you just say a nice word. You probably didn't really mean it. For example, you know, you say the new baby is born. You say, oh, mashallah, he's so adorable. You know, you might not think he's really that adorable yet. But you just say it just for the sake of it. So the, similarly, that's madh. In Arabic, that's madh, which also means to praise. But it's not a sincerely genuine praise. Like, you know, you talk about a car, that's a nice car. Someone, you, one of your friends bought a car. Actually, you probably might not like the car, but you just say it anyway because he's your friend. So that way, that's madh. We're going to understand the word hamd by using the word madh. So the word hamd actually is a word that talks about the, the, the praise but also it's genuine. It's done sincerely for humans. It's done there. It's always there for the... For, basically, we're starting for the sake of Allah. So the two meanings of hamd is our two meanings combined. Praise, which is genuine, and thanks. And when we say and in English, the thing is that when, if we say all praise and thanks are due to Allah, we're kind of saying that all praise is due to Allah, and sometimes all thanks is due to Allah, and other times all praise is due to Allah. But the thing is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say, say in the Qur'an, al-madhu wa shukru lillah. He said, alhamdulillah. So the thing is that when we say and in English, it's basically because of the definition, by definition of the word hamd, it's all together. It's always praise is due to Allah and always thanks is due to Allah. So when we proceed with alhamdulillah, we're supposed to try to internalize some lessons with this too. So when people ask us how we're doing, we say, alhamdulillah, I'm doing well. Uh, is anything going on? You know, no, actually, Alhamdulillah, uh, a lot of things have been going on. This happened, that happened. You start, you start your whole complaint cycle with Alhamdulillah, for example. But the whole meaning of Alhamdulillah is you internalize who Allah is, you understand who Allah is, and you thank Him absolutely under, basically without circumstances. It's independent. Also, what we are taught to do as Muslims is that we praise Allah on circumstance as well. We praise Him both ways. So we're praising Allah for not only what He's done, but we're also thanking Him for what He's done. So if He's put you in trials and you start complaining, that defeats the whole purpose of Alhamdulillah. That's not Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah is all praise and thanks are due to Allah. I'm thankful to Allah and I praise Him for what He has done. That's the meaning of Alhamdulillah. So next time we want to perchance complain about something, we should think about that. And in Surah to Yusuf, we learn from Yaqub salam, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that He says, I only complain of my complaints and all my problems to Allah. Innam ashtu basi wa huzni ilallah. He says, that's all like my griefs, all my sorrows, I complain to Allah. So that's one thing we could try to internalize bismillah ta'ala. And then we move on, Rabbil Alameen. And one of the most, it's generally translated, but one of the most under, misunderstood statements, for example, Rabb, we think, we, we, we're gonna dive into the word Rabb. It's al-Malik wal-Sayyid, wal-Murabbi wal-Mun'im, so all these words in Arabic basically teach us about the word Rabb. Rabb is basically, it starts off, the word we translate as Lord. But we're going to try to internalize this word Rabb. The word Rabb actually, when we go into it, talks about a, an owner. And that owner, who is, he's full of giving gifts. And then he, at the same time, he's a master. He has possessions. Right? So then when we proceed to the, deeper into the meaning, we go into the, the one who takes care of us. And the one who sustains us, the one who keeps us, us upright. 
So this is Rabb. And remember, this is an introduction to Allah. So he calls himself Rabb. So when we internalize all of this, Rabb basically means a master that has all these characteristics. For example, Allah is the one that is keeping our backs straight right now. And if we believe otherwise, we need, to re we need to go back and fix our beliefs. For example, generally, you know, one of those things that you hear, you don't really, you don't understand it. But it's just, you know, when you eat, it's not the food that is giving you the, you know, giving you the fulfillment of hunger. What is it? It's the permission of Allah. It's the, it's the amr, it's the command of Allah. It's the permission. It's, it is Allah himself. So with that kind of, that mentality, that's how we should exist as Muslims. So when we say, Rabbil Alameen, master with all these characteristics, so that automatically means if we acknowledge Allah as master, which we should, that means we are slaves. And if we acknowledge Allah as Al-Qayyim, the one who makes or who sustains and maintains and keeps us standing upright, then we have to understand that we are the ones being kept upright by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah is the Sayyid, if He's the master, then we are the ones who are in His possession. So like that, we translate Rabb. And this in, in itself is a very comprehensive term. So we move on into Al-Alameen. So Rabbil Alameen is an idhafa Rabb of Al-Alameen. So the word Alameen is mostly translated as worlds or universe. And actually the thing is that Al-Alameen, the thing that I've studied is that when you have an ina ending like this, it pertains to people. People meaning insan, jinn, or, or a malaika. One of those three uh, main categories. So it not only talks about just these people, it talks about their ethnicity, and the most important thing is their generation. So when we say Allah is the Rabb of al alamin it's that Allah is the master and the one who has sustained the people that have existed, that are existing, and will exist. So also we say Allah is also the, the sustainer of those, the jinn that are existing, have existed, will exist, and the malaika that are existing as well. So the comprehensive translation of Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, it's not just all praise and thanks to be to Allah, Lord of the world. See, that, that definition in of itself, it doesn't give us much things to think about. The more proper translation, in my opinion, is the ultimate praise and thanks. The ultimate and deserving praise and thanks was, will, and will always be due to Allah, the Lord, the Master, the reason for sus the sustenance and the existence of the people, jinn and malaika, that have existed, are existing, and will exist. Minus the malaika, for there. So also, if you notice that I said all praise and thanks, the ultimate praise and thanks was, is, and will always be due, due to Allah. And the reason I translated it is like that is because Allah starts the whole Qur'an with an ism, with a noun, alhamdu. We didn't start the Qur'an by saying ahmadullah, we didn't say uh, ahmadullah, nahmadullah, we all praise Allah, praise Allah, I praise Allah, we didn't say any of this. The reason is because if we said any of those words, it would be a verb. And a verb, by definition, is bound by tense, it's bound by time. So if I say I praise Allah, what happens when I'm gone? Is the praise of Allah gone? Obviously not. So that's why Allah starts the Qur'an with an ism, with a noun, that shows that a noun is permanent. The, the verb, the fi'l, is it's temporary. So we're based on that temporary. We're transient ourselves. We're temporary. So when we continue on, we, we understand that the noun being permanent, that's how Allah started to the start of the Qur'an. So the ultimate and deserving praise and thanks. You thank Allah for what He's done. And you always, always think unconditionally. You don't, you know, nothing happened to you. You're just sitting around doing nothing. You're bored, and you say, Alhamdulillah. Why? Allah, even unconditionally, He deserves this praise. So we say, Alhamdulillah, the ultimate praise and thanks, together at the same time, and deserving was, is, and will always be for Allah, the Master, the one responsible for our sustenance, sustenance and existence, Lord and Master of the all the people, the ins, the jinn, the mal the malaika, the people that have existed are existing and will exist. So we talk about Alme Arwah, and we talk about Dunya and Al Barzakh. So Barzakh is the ones that have passed away. Dunya is what we're in now. We call Arwah the world of the souls in which Allah has set aside the souls, but He hasn't given them existence yet. For example, many of the youth's kids here, they would all be in there, bismillah ta'ala. So may Allah grant us all beneficial and righteous offsprings, inshallah. So we continue with the next ayat, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. One of the most, now we could say controversial as well. Basically, in a nutshell, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim both come from the word Rahma. We translate this as beneficent, the most beneficent, the most merciful. We never use the word beneficent in our, in our daily lives. The whole point of translation is to translate from a language you don't understand to a language you do understand. So when you read things like the most beneficent, it's still something you don't really understand. So that's why we have to try to dig deep. And the whole point of this is to try to dig in ourselves 
and we try to understand it, and we take our times out, we take our time out to try to understand these types of things. So we say, Ar Rahman. Rahma basically is something in which Allah covers us from all angles. Allah says, Wa Rabuka al Ghafuru Dhu Rahma. Allah, your Rabb is the owner, is the, the one who possesses Rahma. He says that if Allah was to yield or take or just grasp the people for what they have done, definitely the punishment would have hastened towards them. So Allah even holding the punishment away from us is a form of rahmah. And Allah not only holds the punishment away from us, He holds it away from the kuffar as well. So that is also a rahmah. So we translate the word rahman. It has to do with mercy. That by definition, there's three concepts of Rahman. One, it's extreme. It is absolutely at the highest maximum power. Ar Rahman, at the on ending, it shows exaggeration, but in this point, in this point, when Allah exaggerates, it's more than true. So absolutely merciful. At one more in another definition also added to this is that when we talk about Allah's mercy, it is happening right now. For example, Allah has not sent the adab to us. May He not send that send that to us. I mean. So we, we are told this, that now Allah says that He's a rahman So we're saying that also His mercy is in action right now. It is happening right now. And the third thing we're taught is that the, the mercy of Allah, it is transient. Or in this sense, when Allah uses the word Rahman, it is transient. It means it's, it, you could do something to take it away. So in, in an example, to try to understand the word Rahman, it's like saying someone's hungry. They're not going to stay hungry, right? So when they say they're hungry, what could take away hunger? Food. So actually, what could take away this mercy of Allah? Right? What could take it away? Us disobeying Him. So when we try to understand this, then we go on to the next word, Ar-Rahim. Also mercy. But in this definition, it has two. One of them is which? Is that it is something permanent. It's, the, it's there. The second thing is it may not necessarily be happening right now. For example, one has strength. Right? So he has strength, but he necessarily might not be using it right now. He might be asleep. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have that strength. So we say we translate Rahman and Rahim as the absolutely the intensive and the intensely merciful with his mercy that is happening right now. And also we could do something that could take it away. At the same time, he can possess the mercy to give us an eternal life of mercy. And at the same time, at that point we understand that it will truly be happening. So one of the scholars, Rahimahullah, he says that if you want to imagine Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, Ar Rahman is like the ocean in a storm with the high waves that are about to crash down, and Ar Rahim, that's like the calm ocean, calm waves, endless, seems endless. It just goes off to the horizon. Just like one cannot imagine a storm within an, in, in an ocean and the calm ocean at the same time, one cannot imagine the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But now we need to understand that we might misinterpret this. And we might put in misapplication of the misinterpretation of this. The meaning being is that we say, oh man, Allah is so merciful, I can't even understand it. So I may as well just, you know, <coughs> disobey him a little bit here and there. The thing is that we need to understand the Quran in the proper way. And one of the Sahabi, we know him as one of the most knowledgeable in the Quran after the Prophet wasallam, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. He says that Ar-Rahman is the mercy that pertains to every creature alive in this dunya right now. And Ar-Rahim, oh that's for the, that's for the believers in the year after. Remember when we talked about Ar-Rahim? It's a, eternal and it might not be happening right now. Well in Jannah it will be there and it will always be happening and it will be eternal. But what will it be for? The believers. So that's what we're taught is that don't misinterpret this verse. Don't try to think that the mercy of Allah is so vast that you can go about doing what you want. Don't forget the meaning, one of the meanings of Ar-Rahman. The mercy in which you might do something that could take it away. So this is something we, we should try to internalize. And then we continue on with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We call him Malik Yawmiddin. Malik, master, owner. So we say Malik Yawmiddin. And we notice we didn't say Malik al-Fasl. We didn't just say Allah is the master of judgment. We said master of the day of judgment. And the word deen is used here. Deen is also used in other cases like the religion, the basically our way of life. And in this case, it's something that is... Like you take a loan and you you document to pay it back at a specific time in a specific amount, etc. It's very specific and accurate. So it's very precise. So similarly, it's like we're going to pay back our we're gonna pay we're gonna look at Allah and pay at him for what we've done basically. So he's gonna reward us based upon our actions. 
So it's like a complete, precise hisab calculation. And also we're taught that Allah says, Malik Yawmiddin. Now that Yawm isn't just there for no reason. Allah is also teaching us one thing. Yawm is a unit of time. Yawm is day. Day is a unit of time. We convert seconds to hours, to minutes, and all, etc. Days, years, etc. Day is a unit of time. No human can control time. No body can control time. Nothing can control time except Allah. And that's something we should try to understand because Allah says, Malik Yawmiddin, master of the day of the judgment in which every precise calculation will be made. And he's the owner of it. And so Allah warns us that, you know, he, he talks about this after the verse of mer the mercy. He says, you know, I, I'm this merciful, but don't misinterpret. I'm also going to come after you, Allah says. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take your hisab. I'm going to take your accounts, guys. I'm going to document. I've, I've been documenting from my order everything you guys say and do. So don't think you guys are going to get off that easy. The mercy of Allah is here, and it will be there for the believers. So Allah is teaching us to work for that mercy. And that's something we need to internalize. So when we say Maliki Yawmiddin, Allah owns the day and everything that goes on inside of the day. And inside that day will be the Hisab. So, Bidnillahi Ta'ala, I'd like to stop off here. We covered three ayat, Alhamdulillah. And we're going to try to, inshallah, next month, Bidnillahi Ta'ala, try to cover a little bit more of the Fatiha and internalize those meanings that we could try to get off, inshallah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, 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 Alhamdulillah <laughs> يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد and so just a recap of what we covered two months ago is that we're trying to internalize the meanings of our salah so we can try to become better Muslims. As Allah says, Inna salata tanha anil wal munkar. Your salah should take you away from animalistic behavior and it should take you away from the, all these sins and fawahish you do and all this, all this wrong stuff that you do, Allah says. So the salah should take you away from that. And if our salah isn't doing that, basically our salah is not doing its job in which some people can interpret that we're not even praying salah. So that's why we're trying to cover the meaning because one of the best ways to let it Salah do its magic or it's the thing it does by the permission of Allah is to understand what you're saying during it and that's what we're trying to cover ta'ala. but one more thing is that it's not just in a khutbah that we can understand this kind of stuff it's that we go home and research it ourselves and so I'd like to share a story that kind of gives us this insight the story is that a king we're told that a king told one of his one of the people in his kingdom you know he liked him very much so he says you know man Go run, you know, start off daybreak, whatever. Go run as far as you can and circle, like basically make a border. Run around whatever you ground, you run around, make a border and come back by sunset. And whatever land you tread around, so if man goes up and then left and then back down and then makes a corner back to the place he starts, all that land will be given to this man. All the land will be given to this man, says the king. And the king owns the land, ta'ala. So the man says, yes, I'm going to go do this. He starts running and running. He's supposed to be back by sunset. And as he's running, he sees a mountain. He's like, oh man, I wish I had that. You know, that would really be... You know, kind of the inference is the, the conclusion, the example I'm drawing is that we chase dunya like this. So he chases the mountain. He's like, oh man, I wish I had that. He goes back, he goes by the mountain. He says, man, I wish I had those hills. Man, I wish I had those gardens. He sees all of them, then he's like, oh man, time's running out. I better, I better run back. So he starts running back as fast as he can. He's running, he's running, he's running so bad, he trips and he dies there. And the scholar mentions that his, the land that he really owned was that six foot deep thing, that grave that he was dug in. So this is, this is intended to teach us that, you know, however much we chase the dunya, we shouldn't be chasing more than what we necessarily might need or might need in the near future or distant future. So actually what we should be doing is balancing our time between this chasing of the dunya, basically earning risk for the sake of Allah, just to feed our families, and then at the same time we're trying to process knowledge, we're trying to understand knowledge. Because at the end of the day when we say in Fatiha we want guidance from Allah, 
what we, when we say guidance, guidance, all guidance is is knowledge coupled with action. That's all it is. Guidance is knowledge coupled with action. You might have knowledge and no action. You might have action but no knowledge. And that what well, you might be doing bid'ah at that time. So you, the important thing is we need to understand, we need to internalize, we need to study. And after that, what we need to do, we need to try to implement that in our actions. So basically, this is the meaning of what we're supposed to be trying to do in this dunya. Remember, we're not going to be here that long. Two months ago, Dr. Baig was here. Today, he's not. Hafizahullah wa rahimahullah. Wa rahim, wa and may Allah have on everyone who has passed away. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those that can sacrifice our time and ourselves. Because we're meant to sacrifice ourselves for his sake, to worship him. We're not supposed to be doing what we want. And if we think that we can do what we want, then we're not having the mentality of a slave. So that's something we should try to keep in mind, bi ta'ala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us. Mm-hmm. And a dua we could ask is that, Allahumma hasibana hisaban yasira. Oh Allah, give us a reckoning, give us an account, give us a calculation that's so easy. Give us an easy account. Allahumma hasibana hisaban yasira. So we should try to remember that and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because guidance comes from asking. So all these things will come from asking and, and understanding. Understanding will come from asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after that, it will come from studying and giving time out. So that's what we're trying to go after, bi ibnillahi ta'ala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy. Ibadallah, rahimahkumullah, ibn Allah, ya'udhu bil adli wa al-ihsan, wa inta idhi al-qurba, wa yinha an al-fahshah, wa munkin wa bhabi. A'idhukum la'adakum tadakaroon, wa'udhu yadhkurukum, wa da'udhu 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 yadhkur